talking alternative building materials today. If you want to join us, we are a team of volunteers passionate about sustainability in the built environment. And with a little bit of effort, we can make this happen and more hands make life easier. So if you want to join us and you would already really help us by following us on YouTube or on LinkedIn and liking this stuff on our social media so that we get a, a larger following. Today, we're talking alternative building materials, and we have a sponsor for in a long time. We haven't had a sponsor, but today we have a sponsor, which is Efremat Hemp. So Efremat Hemp is a Cape Town based company pioneering and beneficiating the industrial hemp industry in Africa. They believe that to create a sustainable world for all generations to come, we must think differently now and challenge the status quo. They believe that it's their duty to influence worldwide movement to reduce global carbon emissions to a net zero world. And they happen to make amazing hemp products. So they feel like they have the solution in their hands. They are specializing in natural building materials, hemp, and I'm gonna pronounce this completely wrong, decortication. And I had to look that up on Google to understand what that means. It means removing the restrictive layer of fibrous uh, tissue so they do hemp decortication and processing and also uh, bulk processed hemp and natural fibers have a look at their website this little video comes from their website it's a great little video and they have some other great stuff on their website also they were presenting in a webinar we did in september 2022 it's on our youtube channel so they were presenting on that building that hemp building the highest hemp building in, I think it's in the world, uh, in Cape Town. So I think it was uh, 12 stories. So if you are interested, go to our YouTube channel, September 2022, they were presenting on that project. Yeah. We are very appreciative of their sponsorship today. If they didn't sponsor us, we couldn't offer you um, CPD points. So we are very happy they could sponsor us today. Here's the webinar. This is what it looks like. If you go to our YouTube channel, you can find it. It was also alternative building materials and um, Shanae Bloom was presenting in this webinar. All right, but back to today, we are talking about eco bricks and another hemp product. And the eco bricks is going to be talked by Diana Musara and Josephine. And Diana Musara holds a master's in entrepreneurship and value creation at WITS. And she has over 20 years of experience in human resource management. And she's been running her own HR and entrepreneurship consultant company over 10 years. However, she's also been involved with a nonprofit organization for four years, which is called Earthy Touch Foundation, where she has been working with the EcoBricks construction material and she's also executive director of Kansani's collection and uh, Rotarian so she will talk about more about that on who they are and then we have Josephine so Diana and Josephine are presenting together and Josephine has also been recognized as a success story by We Connect International Business Network in 2019 and has been awarded with the Pareto Top Performing Business Award um, in 2022 and recognized by the Rotary International Club for championing the environmental projects to save the planet in 2021. And she's been recognized by the African Earthenizers in 2022 and SA Heroes in 2023. So these two ladies are absolute heroes in trying to save the planet of their plastics. And they will talk about that just now. And then after the two ladies have done their presentation, I'm going to invite Nadine to take over. And Nadine is an architect turned into a hemppreneur with a passion for sustainable material innovation, pioneering prefabricated hempcrete building solutions in South Africa and Central, Af and Central Africa. She will be presenting on the unfolding hemp industry in South Africa and the possibilities of downstream hemp products from this to benefit the construction industry. She will give an overview of the company Bioka which is a uh, utilizing hemp in concrete form in, of hempcrete and they have developed panels for off-site construction and on-site assembly 
and I've seen the presentation already because she presented to my team at Solid Green, and I know you guys are going to be blown away. Diana, Josephine, you want to kick it off? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and Melrose, thank you for the opportunity. My name is uh, Diana Musara, so I'm here to present about our organization called Earthly Touch Foundation. Our slogan is, we have to save tomorrow today. So this is really a plastic movement where we are looking at how we can use plastic as an alternative product. If we just talk about our organization, it's already been said, uh, it was established in 2020 to really focus. We are based in Jobek. The first project was implemented in Deep Sloot here in Jobek. Our services really, we look at raising awareness and giving training about the impact of plastic, plastic pollution. We also run initiatives around waste collection. We also for organizations that approach us who want to implement projects on waste management, especially on the eco project, we run projects with them. We really look at also sustainable communities, how we can implement processes and products in a community that is sustainable. Also looking at upcycling, which is products that can be upcycled and are recycled in the plastic environment and also the construction. And our main focus today, we're going to be talking about the construction side that we did with EcoBricks. So if we can move on and look at what is an EcoBrick. So what it is really is a pet bottle packed with solid clean and dry used plastic. And this is plastic that can be recycled. So what you look at is plastic bags from your checkers, pick and pay, photo papers, scripts, packets, food containers, straws, plastic cutlery, cling film, plastic fruit, and all that. All that can be put in an ecobic bottle. The ecobic bottle can vary. For us, for our project, we have been using the two liter ones. So again, like I've mentioned, it has to be clean. Any of this type of plastic, you need to make sure that you collect, you clean it and it's dry. The next thing that you need is your bottle, your plastic bottle. The bottle also, it must have a bottle top and it must also be clean and dry. You also need a stick. The stick is what you're going to be using to compacting the bottle. So any plastic that you have, you put it in the stick is what you use for compacting it. Once you have compacted the bottle, the eco brick is full. The eco brick for us, the two liter bottle, I'm going to also talk about the measurements, can weigh and should weigh from a quality point of view, minimum 500 to 650, 660 grams, if it's a two liter bottle. And once it's fully packed, it's ready, it's in a brick, you are ready to build with it. But what is important is the bottle, if it's filled in correctly, it's insulated and it's also fire resistant. Again, in terms of the weight, you can use eco bricks of any kind, any size. But once you have decided on what, which one you want to use, they must all be the same size. So if you go, decide to go with the two liters, you know that this is what you're going to be using. So you use it throughout for your building. Like I said, the maximum weight for a two liter can go up to 660 grams. And this weight is important because that's where the safety aspect comes from. So you need to make sure that you comply the dryness, it has to be clean and it has to weigh the correct weight. So that's what an eco brick is. So what we have done is we've run quite a number of awareness workshops and, and training and really it focuses around the plastic collection and then how you repurpose an eco brick, how you make it correctly. You can see we've got several organizations that joined us to do this. We also train them in terms of how you can use a plastic bottle, which is the same, the two liter bottle in terms of doing your eco garden and train them in terms of how to establish eco gardens. And lastly, our main flagship has been the construction that we have done. The targeted organization is really communities. What is important is in Deep Sloot, we have used this as a way for the communities to clean up their environment. We have actually gone to a point whereby an eco brick has become a currency. So for us to get this movement going, we encourage the people in the community, we encourage the kids to say, we get donated goods like food, like clothing. Anyone who wants 
because they normally come to us for donation. Anyone who wants any donations, we say to them, go outside, pick up plastic, pick up the plastic litter, clean it up, make an eco brick, and then you can buy whatever you want from us by using eco bricks, especially with our kids as well. If they want stationery or anything that they want for the school, because Kentani's collection is our beneficiary. So this eco brick building and school was built for the benefit of uh, Kentani's collection, which is extra classes. So kids, nothing comes for free. If you want anything, you bring eco bricks, you pick plastic, you bring eco bricks, and then we give you stationery. And that way the community became mobilized to actually now see value in plastic, where plastic was dead. Now it's something that is valuable and we are using them to also use it to build their own homes. They can come and touch it. So that's as far as our training and who we work with. So again, the awareness you can see these are school children. If you go to Alma Mata, every desk, a child has got an, a plastic bottle. So every time that there is any plastic, they put it in a plastic bottle. So their slogan is put it in a bottle. That's what has been happening all over. Communities, retirement villages, everyone is involved. Again, waste collection, we do have cleanup events. Here we're joined by Old Mutual, where they cleaned up. After cleaning up, we taught them how to cut it, shred it into plastic, how to make an eco brick. So everything we did it together with them in this cleanup event. But there is a lot of cleanup events that are happening in the surrounding areas and in deep sloot involving the community. At this moment in time, we have people who are making eco bricks in the comfort of their own homes. Some are making them in schools what they then do is once you have done that jackson's in brinestone jackson's in midrand and then at my own house in bruton uh, brinestone free wildlife in uh farm in midrand uh, kentani in deep Sloot and greenstone shopping center that's where everyone can go and drop off their eco brick like i've said to you guys it's easy to do you can do it in the comfort of your home even when you're watching tv so there's no reason for you to live with plastic which is harmful for you guys and as you know plastic and uh, plastic pollution contributes to type 2 diabetes and also causes cancer in deep Sloot, a lot of them like we see behind there they normally come and bend this plastic once once it's bent it spreads all over just like covid we all breathe it so sometimes you might think that it's happening in the township it doesn't affect us but it's in the air and we are breathing this air and it's affecting us health wise and then with global warming again the carbon emissions so plastic is harmful let's all work together to clean it up and get rid of it various schools these were schools that came and get involved but what happens as well with this plastic that we pick up if we are not using it for making eco bricks there are other centers who are buying the plastic who are using it to recycle because at this moment in time we don't have a manufacturing company where we can then have the plastic manufactured into other end products our wish because we are dealing in the education and we support some education uh, organizations like Kentanis collection is to be able to bring this plastic, repurpose it into plastic, into desks and chairs so that our children are in an eco brick building, their chairs are made of plastic, everything is made up of recycled plastic. Again, our kids were involved in the construction of this classroom. This is an example where we taught them the skills transfer in terms of how to make eco bricks, but at the same time, we taught them in terms of how to construct with eco bricks. So the training is not only restricted to people who are trained to do that, but we are getting everyone in the community involved in this. And these are the Kentani kids, but we've got kids and also people from the community coming to build. So this is a school built by the kids. The plastic was collected by them. So when you talk to them, they were actually they are so proud that they got rid of plastic. They collected and cleaned up their environment and they built their own school. So they are not a charity case, but they are getting involved to take responsibility of their own environment. What we decided to do is over and above that, we have eco gardens because everything has to be eco. So you can see the vertical gardens because we have got limited space. So there we are cutting the plastic and we are planting our vegetables. At the back, we have got trees to make sure that our environment is green. And we also have planted what we call fruit trees for the benefit of the kids. 
So the manufacturing, I've already spoken about it in terms of where we are going with it. When we're done with the building, we can also use it to make furniture. This is our construction team. These are the guys that are really experts that have learned they come from a construction industry. They were builders using the normal building material, but now we brought them in to say, what is it that we can do with this eco brick? And they brought the expertise and these are the guys that helped us with the construction. I'm going to hand over to Josephine, who is going to talk about the two projects that we ran. So the first one was a construction of an eco brick, which was 45 square meter classroom, which was done in 2020. And then we waited for three years to see whether this building was going to stand because everybody was going to tell us that there's no way that you can build something with a plastic bottle and it can stand and all that. So it did. And then after three years, we decided that we're going to construct few more classes. Josephine will take you through on the next slide what we did as far as the construction is concerned. Good afternoon, everyone. Diana has mentioned, so our first eco brick classroom, a 45 square floor area, which was constructed in February 2020, we used 12,000 eco bricks, an each buckle weighing a minimum of 550 grams. We used 4,000 eco-cent bricks, each weighing 3.5 kg, and these were used on the foundation and flooring. So altogether, these 12,000 eco-bricks, the ones with the plastic, and the other 4,000 empty uh, plastic bottles, we would have diverted from the landfill approximately seven tons of waste of plastic, which also is equivalent to approximately seven tons of carbon dioxide emission if you use a conversion rate of one kg plastic to one kg carbon dioxide. And then in July 2023, we commissioned the eco brick classroom block of 192 square meter floor area, which we also used approximately 60,000 eco bricks, each weighing a minimum of 550 grams on the walls and the 12,000 eco sand bricks we use them on the foundation and the flooring and each also weighing about 3.5 also in the foundation we managed to garner construction rubble from the nearing neighborhood who were into construction so that we could also put it into the foundation and flooring so in this uh, 192 square floor uh, area building in uh, total, approximately 33 tons of waste plastic was diverted from the landfill. So resulting in approximately 33 tons of carbon dioxide emission, which was saved. So the green building principles applied on both these two buildings is that on the uh, foundation and flooring, as you can see, instead of using the cement bricks, uh, we went for the eco sand and uh, eco bricks and the construction rubber. And on the building walls, we didn't use the cement bricks and the metal brick force. Instead, we used the eco bricks and plastic nylon rock. And for the mortar, in our recipe, we reduced the cement by substituting with a bit of clay soil and hay, because both of these material, the clay soil and hay, they also have binding properties and thermal properties. On the building roof, instead of using the zinc 100%, we also alternated with recycled roof sheets, which are clear, so that they could also bring in light and then we can re, uh, use less of the lighting bulbs. On the power supply, we're fortunate to have a donor who gave us a solar PV system. So the system is powered by solar PV system. And on the water supply too, uh, although the site is on the municipality, but we have two Georgia tanks of 5,000 liters, and we hope to commission the rainwater harvesting. It's not yet commissioned, so we're seeking out for the accessory so that we can actually commission that. So on the two buildings in total, we actually uh, managed to um, uh, save 40 tons of carbon. Uh, another initiative implemented on the site is the El Dolu toilets. These ones, uh, they have a double concrete 
heat, which is then covered with a five micron uh, high density polyethylene to prevent underground water contamination. So it has recently been installed on our site and is under trial uh, so that they can actually harvest grey water from there, which can be used on the school grounds. So in terms of the integrity of the building from the eco bricks, so there are a lot of questions. People are very concerned and worried and all those questions. So if you recall from the beginning of the presentation by Diana, the first thing which is very important is number one, making sure the eco brick is densely packed with the material. It is built according to that guideline. So that's the first thing. Then the second one, obviously on quality assurance, when building, we made sure each and every bottle was weighed to meet the required specification. And thirdly, we applied the same normal traditional construction technical principles which are acquired. This is why we used uh, the general building constructor who are used to constructing a normal building. And then we taught them and we went through the process of, of applying the new material versus the old material. And number four, the same safety issues which are expected when a building is being constructed were also applied. So in terms of weather resistant, as we said, when you're building, making that eco brick, uh, after you've completely packed it, no air inside, you seal it with a cap, you make cracks on the eco brick. And this is why it's recommended to use a, a, a wooden stick. Then uh, secondly, after the wall is erected with eco bricks, it can be cladded with any material. So in our instance, we cladded with mortar. And that mortar, again, we reduced the cement by making sure we add some clay soil and hay. But any other material can be used to clad inside and outside in such a way that you can just make any aesthetic look you want. And people would never even realize that inside these two cladded walls, there's eco. Others use mesh wire, depending on the application of the building. And in terms of fire resistance, in terms of the uh, Global Ecopric Alliance, if you go on their website, uh, www.ecopric.org, there is that guideline on how to make a uh, compliant Ecoprix if you want to construct any application building or whatever. So if you go on that website, it gives you a guideline. And below it, there's a website again, which says ecoprix.org.fire, which demonstrates that a fire resistance uh, testing was carried out in South Africa to test the, the, the lead time, 30 minutes to an hour. So it is just like any other building which could fall under that mishap. But yes, a testing was done to carry out how fire resistant the eco brick uh, wall is. So you can also go on these websites and read more uh, so as to understand the integrity of the building around all those characteristics. I'll hand over to Diana. Thank you. In terms of the uh, benefits, the center itself is now just being used as an infrastructure for teaching children after schools. We also use it as a skills development center for entrepreneurship training, job creation for the local, for women and youth as part of this project. We also use the center for training pregnant moms and teenagers as a support where they come for their antenatal and postnatal classes. And the biggest one is the reduction of uh, pollution in our environment. Again, this I've already covered. I'm not going to go through it. Those are some of the uh, parties involved in the project. Most of them are schools, and, so, and these are more of the corporate companies. We have Roots and Shoots, Old Mutual, African Bank, Gibbs, Mukuri Financial House, Vodacom, Redefined Properties, Praktara Mining, 3M South Africa, For Good Foundation, DJ Muir Trust, uh, Yes, We Can Business Network, Rotary Club of Morningside, and Deloitte. And then uh, our future projects that we have, we have got one for Tikatoho Disabled Center in Mpumaranga. Uh, we have got another one that is identified, an ECD center that we want to build in Deep Sloot. And then Kentani, we have got some few finishing touches. And then together with Roots and Shoot, we are going to be taking this project into Zimbabwe. And then we've got another one in the Free State. Again, from Pumalanga, what we are going to be doing, it's a center for the disabled. So what we are really appealing to everyone is we are looking for skills, architects, construction, people who are engineers to come and join us if you want to see how this is done. Some of the things you can read on your own, what we are looking for, it's going to be an 80 square meter floor area. And we are estimating that it will cost us plus or minus 380,000 to build. 
And then the ECD center, it's going to be 130 square meters. Again, our requirements are the same. We are looking for skills. We are looking for volunteers. We are looking for building material. We also need transport is one of a major one because people make eco bridge and we need to go and collect. And then uh, Kentani, we still have to finish with the grey water. We are also going to put eco towers together with Sun International. We are going to be piloting that. The grey water has already started. And then if you need to hear more about us, see the work that we are doing, instead of me showing you a video, you can go read up or go on YouTube, watch any of these videos. It will, they will tell you more about the work that we have done. And with that, I thank you for your time. I hope this was uh, insightful and it's something that you guys, we are looking for any one of you guys who wants to know more about it, who want to join in the movement to come and work with us on all these projects that we have earmarked. But we thank you. Thank you so much, Diana and um, Josephine. That was really insightful and it's mind blowing how much plastic you can save and just, you know, put it in these bottles and and use it as a as a building material i think as an architect it's a completely different way of building and it might scare a lot of us but i think you guys are just heroes by actually doing the work and just doing it instead of thinking of it too much i'm going to hand over to nadine she's going to share her screen and talk to us about a great hemp product that she has been developing over the last couple of years. Thanks for the intro, Malus. And if I can commend the ladies with the Eco Bricks, it's so nice to see it being done. We know how hard it is to get going. So well done to you. So today I'll be running through how we are navigating the changing construction industry the marvels of hemp and hempcrete, how we've utilized that into making panels, and of course the great hemp industry in South Africa, which we are pushing and wanting to succeed. So first I'll highlight some very big glaring informants that have determined the way we've been thinking um, very early on in our business. First I'll look at Africa's demands, growing demands by 2050. We'll have a growing population of a billion people. We'll need 20 million homes, 10 million classrooms, a million clinics, more than anywhere else in the world. And we question whether our current construction methods can keep up with that from a materials and renewability point of view, from a quality point of view, and from a longevity point of view. Can they perform the way we need them to in this changing climate and world? And secondly, I'll look at our carbon emissions and energy consumption, which are big topics globally. Our construction industry is responsible for 38 and 35% of those respectively. This is operating buildings, especially residential homes, and of course, all the embedded energy that goes into making the products we use in construction, like concrete and steel, they've got high embedded energies, requiring a lot of electricity to power those, which in our country leads to more carbon. And our industry here is the third dirtiest construction industry globally. So we need to be looking for cleaner methods um, that are scalable and sustainable. So we've got the greatest demand globally. For us, this was the opportunity. We saw the quality and delivery problems. So our lots of labor, but few skills. So we need these scalable methods to meet demands global carbon sequestration targets and in south africa specifically that's very nice to see that in 2022 with our climate change bill being passed we're catching up and it's going to become very important in the way we build same with the materials crisis we need more bio-based solutions that have a very quick renewability rate to keep up with the way we need to build other economic drivers we need our buildings to be better performing than ever, but cost as little as possible. And I think this is one of our main conundrums. So we thought, okay, we need to be part of this change, but how are we going to do that? So I'd like to refer briefly to John Elkington's concept of the green swans, 
we look at the way things have been done over the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, which he calls our black swans. And these were the problems and we just tackled them as we went. So now we're left with a climatic crisis, material crisis, profit-driven architecture and design, if you will, economic limitations, expanding populations, all of that. And we're using this as a turning point in the way we're thinking with sustainable development as our North Star guiding us. So we're trying to be daring, trying to take chances and collaborate with others who are also willing to take those chances. Me, myself, I'm a passionate bio-based material innovation for me. So the last few years, I've been quite lucky that I've been able to spend some time in the Netherlands and in France and really see the the energy that's been there in what can we do with bio-based materials and what can we create. Um, we saw some fascinating things, seaweed and cellulose board, algae tiles, mycelium, but let's be honest, our construction industry is very adverse to change. So how can we scale these? How viable are they? Can we rely on them? What will it be like in 10 years? There isn't really a track record. So we needed to find that in the product we were going to use. So this is where hemp came into the picture. A little bit about it. It was a flourishing industry in the 1700s and 1800s. There was 170,000 hectares globally until the nylon uh, market displacement and the prohibitions came into play in America and the globe kind of followed suit. In the 1970s, hemp was rediscovered and decide why on your own. Um, but by 2019, 40 countries are back at it producing industrial hemp, and we are at a higher hemp yield than ever before. Hemp is not cannabis. It has a 0.2% THC, which is the psychoactive component. It is grown specifically for industrial uses. We plant it very close together, so we get a very high yield climate resilient you can plant it anywhere in the world we've developed various strains for that and it's a champion of regenerative agriculture this means that if you're planting potatoes or mealies or citrus it's a great crop to plant intermediarily between seasons it puts nitrogen back into the soil and fiber and stops the disease and pest cycles and there you get your carbon captured in it. We can use it for construction and normal farming gets to go on and the farmers get an extra income. It's an extremely quick growth cycle of 120 days. That's four months. So no pesticides are required. And you can see here, it's growing up to four meters tall. So all of that energy has been put into the stalk, which is used for textiles and um, other industrial products. Whereas your medicinal varieties are very small plants and all that energy is put into the flowers. So this is the plant that we're after. And basically what we do there is we take the stem of that industrial hemp plant, we mulch that up, mix it with lime and water. The calcium in the lime bonds with the carbon in the hemp and that creates a very robust insulation. It is non-structural, so we would pair that with a timber frame usually. You can use other frames, that's also fine. And together you get your wall. And it's just a simple but fun philosophy of how we got our name is the biomass bonded with the calcium is our bioca. And going back to that question about reliability and how is it performed? What track, what track record have we got? Hempcrete was first invented 40 years ago in France as a means to restore old buildings, very much like this one here. And it became so popular because it was doing so well, performing as such a good material, um, that they just carried on adopting it and the market has grown globally from there. And we've seen it now um, in low cost schemes in social housing, all the way through to upmarket housing and globally, so Mexico, the USA, Europe, China, Australia, and here. So we're getting a very good idea of what it can do in various places around the world. For the builders and architects out there, typically what you would do is mix the materials in a cement mixer, create a formwork, and pack the material in gently, which we refer to as benching. 
Alternatively, in a more sophisticated method, you've got blowers and all sorts of things, and you can project the material onto an existing formwork and remove that formwork. And these are the ways that people have been building on site for many years. A little bit about the properties and what we've been able to learn over the last 40 years and why we think it's such a marvelous material. Concrete is completely non-combustible. Here's a little snip from our fire test when in 20 minutes I could put my hand on the wall right next to the flame. There was no temperature change. Over four hours, um, we reached a temperature of around 90 degrees when the flame was 1,200 degrees. And by the next day, there was just material disintegration. So there was never a flame, never smoke. It's, so it's fantastic from that point of view. Insulating properties. We're looking at an insulation value of a 2.3 R value, which is three times more insulating than brickwork. Um, so just a little case study in a European winter when we visited a hemp building in France, it was not degrees outside, but a fabulous 18 degrees inside without any mechanical intervention. Same in Australia, it was 40 degrees outside, but the interior was 25 degrees. So this graph illustrates that quite well as the highs and troughs of your day night temperatures gone one ahead, the interior made very comfortable and stable. So hemp has that ability to regulate between interior and exterior moistures and temperatures. This one here refers to the temperature of the wall. So again, as your outside temperatures are peaking and troughing, the interiors remained extremely consistent. And the same goes for humidity. It performs and manages it in the exact same way, which together give us buildings that breathe, which is our logo. And what that means is that ability to regulate that temperature and moisture also makes our homes healthy. So by keeping that temperature and moisture in this optimal green zone here, the growth of bacteria, fungi, mites, et cetera, et cetera, which are becoming problematic in airtight um, active house conditions, here it's able to regulate and breathe, which is for us the way to go forward. The big carbon question. This little graph is a summary of the life cycle assessment conducted on a hempcrete panel from extracting all the raw materials, making the panel, delivering that to site and disposing of that at the end of life. The black line here indicates all of that carbon required to make those processes happen. The green was the carbon captured in the hemp used in the process. And that because um, the lime that we use reacts with air, once the building is complete, the building carbonates, it turns back into a form of limestone, which is very cool. So for the rest of its life, it continues to absorb carbon, making this an extremely carbon negative material. But what's even nicer is that it only takes five months to grow. So as your young forest, which they both capture the same amount of carbon, we can watch trees go for 20 years, we can replenish our crops every five months, which is fantastic for us. And a fabulous little showcase, this year's 2024 Olympic Village in France is going to be made entirely from hempcrete. So capturing 25,000 tons in this project leaving the facades to shine and do what they do. It's a fabulous testament to the material. So keeping in mind all of those things about the material and going back to the green swan. So we found a sustainable material of stature. We need to find a building solution that is scalable, good enough for Africa, ignites many local economies, contributes to job creation, and can be innovative and attractive enough for construction companies to want to change. So we've developed a panelized solution that works in line with the DFMA and D construction methodology. So what that stands for is design for manufacture assembly and disassembly. So we would work a BIM model, get panelized a design, generate and create all of the panels in a quality controlled and assured factory deliver to site and quickly assemble. 
Um, and the disassembly part of this is important to note because it opens the doors for all kinds of temporary structures as well that can be very easily dismantled and removed. Our solutions are suitable for cladding existing buildings that are underperforming and may need to perform better. New standalones, including homes, classrooms, and clinics, which we have got turnkey solutions and models for, and multi-story builds, which we'll work to later, which will include floors, roofs, the works, and not just the facades. For now, we are sticking to the facades, letting them do the breathing, the bits they do best, and it's a nice way for us to ease into the market and, of course, merge with other ways of construction that everyone is familiar with. Hybrid solutions are where we like to go. And as for the finishing, any kind of finish is possible, but we like to keep it breathable. So plaster is fantastic. And what we do to mitigate maintenance is we impregnate the plaster with a color, up to 96 variations. And we're working on various techniques of application so that there's still that variety and option there. But as long as we don't have to put a plastic rain screen that would stop the breathability of the material, any finish that that's desired is possible. And just a short representation of a project we're working on in Kenya, where we've got a hybrid construction model going on. We were doing a concrete frame, lightweight brick and fill, and then the facades are just hempcrete. This is the way forward for us, still keeping the green swan in mind and the sustainable transformation going forward. But let each material do what it does best and we create the best and most affordable solution that we can. This one is just a graph for the developers. Anyone interested in comparing your the benefits of DFMA against traditional building? So we've worked quite closely with our QSs to refine this model. And we looked at a two-story build of eight apartments. It would take traditional construction more or less a year to complete. With our Bioka build, we've already got this turnkey of parts in-house, so a quicker design and engineering process. And manufacture can begin before you need to set up on site. So you're looking at a nine month versus a three month P's and G's situation, which can add a lot. Um, and your project can finish up to six months in advance. So that's an interest saved on your capital. You're getting rental income from that stock so much quicker and you can roll out onto your next project that much quicker as well. And then for the builders, we're looking at a 90% reduced human error rate and a 1% accident rate, and 92% reduced waste on site, which is really important for these remote locations where it's not easy to cart back and forth waste materials, and that same goes for water. The project we are looking at in Gabon requires us to deliver it and do everything dry construction with no water. So this is fitting very well into that picture. But to be successful, it can't just be the construction that's designed for manufacturer assembly. We have to take that further and not forget that, okay, if a plumber still has to come onto site, we could still have those delays and problems that come with on-site construction. But we are looking at car manufacturers and they're helping us with harness threading through the walls um, and other pre-manufactured solutions for our plant and plumbing as well. A bit about the product life cycle of our panels. So once it's reached its end of life, which can be um, up to 100 years guaranteed from when it's been made, thanks to all the studies done so far, what we would do is mulch up the existing hempcrete and dose new hempcrete at 10% with the old material. But if the product, let's say the house experienced a fire and the whole panel and all the material needs to be decommissioned, we would mulch that up and just use the existing or old hemp as fertilizer on a new crop. Um, because of that line, which is fertilizer, there's no need to dispose of it in a landfill or anything like that. Any screws, other pieces of wood, bits and bobs, we're looking at creating a local material bank here where like they do in the UK and the rest of the EU, where all leftover bits and pieces, for example, all of our wood can come together and be sent off and re remade into chipboard. But that's a bit of a pipe dream for now, but we'll see if we can get there. 
just a few examples of the schemes that we've been putting together. Our tiny house, which I think Marlous and maybe a few others of you know from another webinar. Um, social housing in Ethiopia, social housing in the Netherlands, and a few of the other projects in Central Africa that I mentioned as well. Right, I quickly want to cast your memory back to these two graphs from the introduction, talking about the carbon emissions and energy consumption by buildings. And this graph illustrates very well how good hempcrete is in not only reducing embedded carbon, but also operational energy related to that. So the orange at the bottom here represents for various construction methods, the, the greenhouse gas emissions related to the embedded energy. So the energy required to make the steel, the concrete, whatever it is. For the traditional construction, it would be that. For hempcrete, it's extremely little. And then your operational energy, also one of the lowest considered next to traditional construction, conscious construction, which might be your passive house standards or your active house standards. And hempcrete, just um, that's traditional low-tech material, stands up very well against those. And again, thanks to the track record we've got, we can see the evidence, we can see the studies. All hempcrete homes have been shown to show a reduction in 30 to 45% in energy usage, which is outstanding and I think will help Africa a lot. And a little bit about we are. So after starting in 2021 and doing our R&D, a few pilot projects, and of course our pilot manufacturing plant in 2023, we are now spending a lot of time in igniting South Africa's local hemp industry. This is so that we can get the local materials. We've been using imported materials to now, which is quite a cost and of course not that carbon friendly. And we're looking at the end of this year and early into next year to be going to market. And then onto this hemp industry, which I think is the most exciting part actually, because it shows the opportunity for everyone else to participate in. The hemp seeds have more protein than beef which is fantastic for local communities who are going to be able to, at some point, grow their own hemp and utilize that grain. We can't yet, it's not legal, but we'll get there. Hemp fibers are the strongest in the world. If you dose a cotton blend with 20% hemp, it will last 10 years longer. And of course, the hemp shives, which we use in the construction, is storing the carbon and acting as that carbon bank and that carbon sink. So just keeping in mind those three offsets, the industry is enormous and the potential for hemp in South Africa is enormous. There's 52,000 known uses for hemp at the moment with 130,000 new jobs that we will be able to create and a huge economic injection for South Africa. And for the construction industry specifically, there is an opportunity to replace drywalling with a hemp mix. Bricks in various forms and shapes and sizes. Furniture as well with a resin blend. Non-woven textiles can be used to make insulation. Other forms of chipboard. We're seeing a beautiful hemp exterior cladding here. A great alternative to IBR and all of our heavy embedded steel products. And most of all, my favorite is this hemp rebar, which is much stronger than steel and non-corrosive. So very good for those products at the ocean. But what's important to remember here is that, for example, for us, although the hemp herd or the hemp shives are 40% of the yield of the plant, economically speaking and revenue speaking, it's only 10% of the worth of the plant. So we can only get so far in this industry without downstream industries picking up at the same time, especially for the seeds and the fibers. So your fibers would relate to your clothing, textiles, that kind of thing, your seeds, the food, supplements, personal care, cosmetics, etc. So we are trying to, I think, all the hempreneurs, if I can call us that, pull together to try and find local downstream industries, collaboratives, 
anything to get our hemp industry going here so that we can all benefit from that economic injection. And I'd just like to shout out to Afrimat Hemp in Cape Town on the work they've done so far. Definitely in the media with the tallest hemp building in Africa, which is fantastic. Also to Chiba Africa, they have made great progress in developing hemp strains suitable for our climate. Teaching people how to farm with it, teaching people how to build with it. It's a fantastic academy. And to Quattro Canna Holdings, who we work very closely with, they're busy, they are busy forming trusts to teach farmers how to integrate the hemp into their growth cycles and create models that protect them and are beneficial to them. Um, so we're working with them to show people how they can be involved in the whole value chain, almost plant and grow and build their homes. So from the planting, harvesting and drying, very manual processing to the making is what we're busy with at the moment. And also, I'd like to just mention that we can get a few hurdles when it comes to getting alternative buildings um, approved. So the CSIR NHBRC, we were at a fantastic conference two weeks ago, where they explained the headways they were making with our municipalities, local municipalities who are changing the way they think about materials and going to and want to approve more of these buildings. We've seen globally how the building in bio-based materials is becoming almost mandatory, and I think we'll follow suit soon. So there's great leaps and bounds being made there. Just to end off, a few of my favorite examples of how we can start the hemp industry from the ground up. So I'm hoping to inspire a few people. Local germination and planting projects in the USA. Small little weaving companies in Thailand. Um, and here's someone extracting resin manually in Turkey, which usually we'd see in Europe or the USA, very technical machines, but it can be done right in the, from the ground up. And most of all, our favorite is the work done in Mexico. While their hemp industry was unlocking, they substituted with whatever they could, coconut husk, agave plant, and made it work all towards the same goal of a bio-based building future. So I hope that sparked your imagination there. If you're looking to collaborate, please reach out to us. Anything and all things hemp, but especially hemp creek building. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. That was amazing. I always manage to learn something new from your presentation. So that's great. So I think it's time for our question and answers. And I'm going to start with a question for Diana and Josephine. And this is the question from Sarah. So she is wondering with the eco bricks as a building material, what do you do with them at the end of life? Is that something that you've that you had a thought of? Like, I guess plastics doesn't really biodegrade at all. Could you maybe reuse them again in a different building once? Maybe the classroom is no longer necessary, which I doubt in South Africa. Have you have you had thoughts around that? So what is good about it in terms of it is you can actually, if let's say you don't need the classroom in that location, you can actually take it down and go and build with it somewhere else because of its durability. We still have to do a bit more work around the end of life in terms of what else can you do with it? So we haven't done a lot of uh, work on it, but it's something that is worth looking at. Mm -hmm. It's at least a very durable product, so it won't. It will last for a long, long time. Mike has a question. I think this one is for Nadine. Are there any biological agents that pose a risk to hempcrete in its installed state, such as mold, insects, termites? And what sort of moisture content does the material stabilize in different environments? Are there any special consideration for wet areas like bathrooms when, when used as a vertical element? Nice question. Thank you for the question. Because of the lime, it is protected against termites. If it was just the hemp, like a wood, you would need to treat it. But the lime functions as that protective element. So good for Africa. In terms of the humidity, 
we cast the material when the hemp is at 15%, but then once we install it and it's adjusting to those climatic conditions, we see a stable interior temperature of 40 to 60%. But what we do to manage different climatic conditions is just monitor the thickness of the wall. So in Europe, for that cold, you would use a 300 to 400 millimeter wall. In Africa, if you use that thickness, your wall would do the inverse of performing and ward the heat and humidity. So 200 millimeters is perfect for that and it does the, the regulation. Great, and then I guess a follow-up question, what is the reaction from the national building regulations and municipal regulations on using a material like hemp, but I guess also for the eco-brick side? So that question I'd like to ask to both of you. Like I mentioned, what we've learned so far from the NHBRC and Agrimar and the CSIR is people are, greatly aware of the changes and the new materials, and they want to test them all and adopt them all, especially in low cost housing models and RDPs. So people are becoming very open to it. It's just a matter of education, we think, becoming familiar, understanding that the product is not so foreign, what it can do, and a bit of a learning curve, I think we all have to go through. Mm, definitely. And Diana, how is that for the eco breaks? Okay, so we have inquired for the process of having it uh, registering this technology agreement essay. So they've given us a procedure. So it's actually working progress. But I think where we are now doing the trials is actually at the beginning of the process. So we hope to also go through until we also get our technology registered. Great. Uh, Mike's question Does the product require agreement? SA approval. Um, if I can speak for us, it it is required. All al alternative building systems, it should be required. Um, we're busy with our Agrimar now. So okay. as far as we're aware, it's it's required. Mike, you raised a hand. Thank you. Thanks. Quick question was um, in terms of the impact resistance compared to traditional building materials, how does it compare? I mean, it, it's probably a, an, a South African oddity in the sense that, you know, on, particularly in social housing in, in parts of the Western Cape, it, it, uh, the question is, is it bulletproof? So, so what, is the, what is the impact resistance like compared to a conventional brick building material? Who's the question for? Uh, that, that'll be for Unity. Oh, thank you. Well, to put your mind at ease, Mike, it passes the knock test. It's completely solid. When I go at it with a, a pick, I can't make a dent in the wall. Compressive stress wise, we consider it not to be able to carry any load. But in terms of robustness, um, it's extremely robust and durable. Okay. Cool. So you haven't done any ballistic tests on it? No ballistic tests, but I can I can make a note of that one. But many... yeah, safety is is an important thing to consider. Okay, no, mm -hmm. excellent. You know, and then just in terms of the of the density per cubic meter, so g going back to safety again, from a conventional building material, how how dense is it per cubic meter compared to concrete or brick? So it equates more or less to your aerated concrete bricks. Um, so about 300 kilograms per cube, which is a 14th that of concrete, just to yeah, put that absolutely. into perspective. Okay. It's great for foundations and things like that and ease of assembly. Okay, but and then, then obviously it, it has some, some tensile strength in it as well, so it's fairly resistant to cracking and can accommodate a fair bit of movement in difficult yes, soil the, conditions. Yes, absolutely. We owe that to the bio-based nature of the wall and the flexibility in the hemp. And the same with the lime. It's extremely forgiving as a plaster finish. Some will even go as far to say it can self-heal its own cracks if they're very small. But it's a very um, flexible and forgiving plaster. And then practicalities from a construction point of view around detailing, particularly doors, windows, that type of thing? Yes, there's lots of literature out there. It's not so tricky. It would be similar to how you would cast something in place if you were to do it that way. 
but I guess that's a discussion as well for another day. We would like to sit with more architects and discuss these details, how we would treat these corners and windows and water and all of those things, but a bit of a knowledge transfer. Okay. And, and lastly, is, is there any brick force requirement in the construction? No, not at no. all. Okay. Only for your lateral stability, which you could use um, tensile steel or timber, depending what your structure was going to be made of. Um, but no brick force, no. Okay, fantastic. Great looking product. Thank you very much. Thanks for your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. There's a question from Petra. What would be the soil conditions and water conditions required for growing hemp? Where would one find offset places for the grown hemp? So with regards to the soil, hemp is very forgiving. It likes a clay soil, but what is the most important is picking the right seed because different seeds are made for different climatic conditions and also different yields of what you want. So the right seed would accommodate those. And I think we're looking at for hemp between 500 to 700 milliliters per year, which is very low. It's almost South Africa's rainfall, which for Avos, I think is about 1,300 millimeters just for comparison's sake. So it's quite a, it doesn't need a hell of a lot of water. Great. So it's good for our country. Uh, Stanley, did I see your hand? Well, yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, th thanks. To Nadine, I'd like to visit your project in Kenya. Where, where, is the, where is the project located? It's still in the development stage at this time, but it will be in just about 100 kilometers south of Nairobi. So quite accessible, but I can keep you posted if you're interested. Yeah, very interested. I would wish to visit and uh, share more ideas about it. Yes, sure. Let me see if there were some other questions. Where can you buy the product? I think Nadine mentioned that to go to her website and contact her directly. There's a question around cost comparison, uh, hemp versus conventional. Nadine, do you have any insights on that? Yes, I've got a short and a long answer. Mm -hmm. So if <laughs> if we are looking at just construction costs, here's the materials, here's the building built and complete, hempcrete construction is about 30% more expensive. But that is also partially due to the industry is only unlocking now, so our materials are not at mass yet, so that price will come down. But I'd also urge you to consider the total cost of ownership. So over... 20, 30 years of having your building with the hempcrete and the lime plaster, you probably will not need to ever repaint or patch for 30 years. And these are from the studies that we've got. So if you can consider the, the longer view and also your operational costs, how much it costs to run the building, you'd start taking all of those less quantifiable things into account. The simple first bottom line, I think we can we can work on that one. Great. Thank you. And as with any innovative building material, it will take time to bring down the cost. We just need to create more demand for it, I guess. Yes, precisely. Exactly. Marty, go for it. Cool. Uh, thanks. Uh, it was a question more on the, um, the hempcrete side, um, just in terms of the properties, I would have thought that um, from an insulation point of view, below roof sheeting or any other sort of roofing, is, do you have something that would be appropriate in terms of panels? Um, they, you know, maybe replacing ceiling panels or all-in-one sort of uh, board that can uh, be self-insulating and also, you know, functional as a ceiling. Yes, thanks, Marty. So hempcrete we can use for walls, floors, ceilings and roofs. And what we do to just manage the performance properties is we've played with the lime to hemp and water ratios. So where we need a denser, for example, wall so that we've got the right acoustics, thermal um, and strength, um, we could have a much lighter mix in our ceiling so that it's far more insulating. So it's applicable in, in all instances and applications there. 
Yeah, because I was just thinking, I mean, you, you, you had mentioned that they aren't structural per se. So typically all the other elements that you mentioned in terms of walls and roofs are all structural to a degree. But if, if you could almost use it as a ceiling board, I think it might be a you know fulfilling that you aren't worried about the structural, but it's also going to give you the good acoustic and absorptive temperature properties. So cool. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. It's a it's a good place for it, especially when our solar heat gains are largely coming from the roof. When I say non-structural, I mean if we were going to use the panels in a two-story instance, for example, then we would definitely need other structural components like the timber frame or like the steel frame. But it's able to hold its own integrity quite well. So perfect for ceilings, I think. Thanks. Great. Oh, I see uh, Diana, you wanna ask a question or yes a uh, question to nadine nadine we are working with a number of women in agriculture and hemp is something that we want to introduce to them as an alternative uh, product where can they go to to find more information in terms of where they can take up uh, this plant they can speak to me, I can put them in touch with the right people because we also need to talk about the right structure around them because you need very specific um, equipment if you're going to be planting hemp on mass and there's certain consortiums who can support them and help them through those processes and also guide them with the right locations. If you've got someone I can speak to, I'm more than happy to guide them. Great, I'd like the collaboration going. That's very yeah. nice. <laughs> no, we That's definitely great. get in touch. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Let me then wrap up the discussion. For March, we have the topic is going to be bioclimatic design. We're going to have two speakers again around that. And then I want to thank all the speakers. Thank you, ladies. It was amazing to hear. You are serious heroes and taking this leap into like all these innovative products and the eco bricks and cleaning up the planet. I hugely admire you guys and being there on the forefront. If you did miss it, Diana and Josephine were asking for volunteer architects if they starting their new project. So put up your hands, contact these ladies and help them out uh, wherever you can on these exciting projects. We should all work together to get this done. Thank you so much, ladies. A uh, big thank you to our sponsor, Efremat Hemp. We really appreciate your contribution and your contribution goes to supplying all the CPD uh, validation for this webinar. So we really appreciate it. And also well done to all the good work you're doing in the hemp industry. We really, really commend you on that. And then again, just follow us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Eventbrite, or if you want to put up your hand to volunteer with us, you're more than welcome, but help us create a good following so that we can create more money to bring you these webinars. Thank you so much for attending. We had a really good turnout, 84 people, 85 people. Thank you so much. Love this webinar again and hope to see you next month again and enjoy your evening and keep up the good work. Thanks for having us.